I was watching uh, CNN on television this morning before I came over here, and I saw a report that uh, the Chinese government had sent around one of its most sophisticated drones uh, to go all the way around the island, uh, a scorpion, which is capable of uh, carrying pretty sophisticated weapons. And the reporter speculated that the flight of this drone might have had something to do with my being here. <laughs> I, I, I would be honored if that's true, <laughs> but but I think uh, it's really a more simply a part of uh, Beijing's overall effort to intimidate the people on this island, and uh, it's been underway for some time. It's growing in strength, uh, but it makes your gathering this weekend, I think, all the more important, because if these acts by the Chinese government are intended to intimidate the people of Taiwan, I think they will find failure because I think it will energize the people of Taiwan to support remaining being a free people in a free country. To help uh, your efforts uh, on behalf of keeping uh, Taiwan free, I do think it's important to understand that we are now uh, entering a new era internationally. I think the post-Cold War era is over. Obviously, the Cold War ended in 1991, and I think too many people in the West in particular uh, felt that, uh, as they said, we had reached the end of history, uh, that there were no more threats in the world, that the collapse of the Soviet Union meant that uh, we could cut our defense budgets, which we did. Um, and, and these same voices said that uh, uh, China would not pose a threat to the rest of the world. It was engaged in a peaceful rise, that it would be a responsible stakeholder in world affairs, um, and, and that uh, China's development would parallel uh, the development of other successful democratic market-oriented economies in the developing world. Now, in fact, as to China, the exact opposite has happened. Uh, we have a country that, uh, uh, so far from becoming more democratic, has become steadily less democratic. Xi Jinping is now the most powerful ruler in China since Mao Zedong. Uh, and if you want to ask about the possibilities of dissent in China, ask Hu Jintao what it's like to be led off the stage of the Chinese Communist Party Congress, one of the most humiliating acts of a political leader I have ever seen. <clears throat> Internationally, uh, China has not been a responsible stakeholder. It has pursued mercantilist policies uh, in what should be a free trade organization, uh, and it has used all of its uh, elements of power to achieve hegemony in the space near China and ultimately worldwide. E even after the attacks on the United States on 9-11, too many people in the West in particular thought we were on a holiday from reality. Growing Chinese and Russian threats were ignored or explained away. Russia attacked Georgia in 2008. Nobody paid any attention. Russia attacked Ukraine in 2014. Almost nothing happened. China militarized the South China Sea, and there were almost no objections. Uh, it has made repeated provocations in the East China Sea, most recently directed at Taiwan, and, and now we'll see what the, uh, what the reaction of the West is. I think the visit of Xi Jinping to Moscow and his meetings with Vladimir Putin really highlight the fact that in the new era we're in, there's a new axis 
between Beijing and Moscow. Different from the Sino-Soviet alliance of Cold War days because China is the senior partner and Russia is the junior partner. But it's the axis together with its rogue state outriders like North Korea and Iran and Belarus uh, that make the entire world a more dangerous place. So I think what we need to do in the United States is uh, awaken from this end of history dream that we've been in. And not just in political military terms, but in economic and social terms as well. And what Taiwan needs to do is to think in the larger context of East and South Asia, where the Chinese threat applies to many nations, that the Chinese threat to South Korea, like North Korea's threat to South Korea, directly affects Taiwan as well. In other words, in the new era that we're entering, because of the combined threats we're facing, the threat to Taiwan is part of a larger range of threats. And I know that may sound uh, like that doesn't give Taiwan the prominence it should have. My argument to you is that being seen as uh, uh, an element of a larger threat actually enhances Taiwan's security because others need to think of Taiwan, not just here on Taiwan or in the United States, but in the wider world. Now, looking at how Taiwan fits into this larger world and, and how it affects the United States and how the United States sees China, I think it's important to define what the Chinese threat is. Um, and for the United States, I think the threat in the 21st century is existential, as it is to Taiwan's independence and has been for some time. Uh, we don't need to guess about this threat. Beijing articulates it almost every day, uh, aimed at Taiwan. Persistent, unceasing efforts to delegitimize Taiwan by extinguishing bilateral diplomatic relations. Uh, the repression Beijing has undertaken in Hong Kong, breaching the handover agreement made with Great Britain over 30 years ago and establishing an ongoing, full-spectrum military buildup with a clear focus on establishing hegemony along the Indo-Pacific periphery, and as I say, ultimately, worldwide. Uh, the Chinese threat is global. I think it's important to repeat that. For example, the utterly false idea that China could be a broker in the Ukraine war. Uh, the example of the Chinese foreign minister symbolizing uh, a new uh, a deal between Saudi Arabia uh, and Iran. Uh, joint Chinese-Russian-Iranian naval maneuvers in the Arabian Sea. And the Belt and Road Initiative reaching into Latin America and Africa. And the Chinese threat is economic and social, as well as political military. The, the Chinese have spent three or four decades or more stealing intellectual property from the United States, Europe, the other developed countries of the world, which they then convert to their own advantage. Uh, they have used companies as arms of the Chinese state. Huawei and ZTE are not telecommunications companies. They, are, they, are, they represent part of China's effort to take control of fifth generation telecommunications so that essentially everything that's said over their networks, said or transmitted as data, can be retrieved by China and used for China's advantage. So w when you look at this overall threat that China poses, uh, we can say that, I think with confidence, that Taiwan is uh, what the Germans call the Schwerpunkt, what Clausewitz focused on in his studies of war. This is, on this island, the center of gravity 
of the Chinese threat. And understanding that uh, helps Taiwan over the long term explain to others also now feeling the Chinese threat uh, why there is a common bond and why efforts at collective protection and self-defense become so important. Now, there are, there are certainly minuses as well as pluses to being the Schwerpunkt because this is where uh, a lot will be decided. Uh, and I understand uh, uh, that uh, there's a lot of discussion here in Taiwan as you enter a presidential election campaign as there is a lot of discussion in the United States about how Taiwan should not be provocative, that Taiwan should be very careful in everything that it says and does. Now, obviously, all government officials uh, try to be prudent. That's important. But let's be clear when we talk about what's provocative. What's really provocative to China is that Taiwan exists at all as it does today. Every morning when Taiwan wakes up, Beijing is offended. And that's not going to change. Uh, so, so my advice, for what it's worth, is in the face of this massive Chinese threat, let's not become obsessed with symbols. Let's focus on uh, concrete reality, not abstractions or gestures. Ultimately, uh, maintaining independence rests on palpable uh, structures of force economically, militarily, and politically. Much more important than the symbols. The symbols, I think, can come later. My former boss, Secretary of State James Baker, uh, used to tell me all the time, he'd say, keep your eyes on the prize. Keep your eyes on the prize. And the prize is maintaining a free government here in Taiwan. Uh, it's a fact that particular verbal formulations are really not going to solve anything. They don't form a defense for Taiwan any more than words really form an offense for China. Take the so-called one China policy. China has so distorted what the Shanghai communique said, has, has twisted what that was intended to mean so dramatically that many people in America say one China policy as if they were following Beijing's interpretation when in fact they don't know the difference and the, and the subtleties that were in that phrase to begin with. So it's not a question of finding the right phrase, it's a question of finding the right capabilities and allies for Taiwan to maintain its status. Uh, and in the United States today, I want to be clear with you, there, there is an example uh, ongoing of a people who have been uh, unjustifiably attacked by their neighbor and are fighting back, and that's Ukraine. Many people thought Ukraine wouldn't fight. They said, well, it's just part of Russia, really, historically. Uh, whereas, in fact, uh, the Ukrainians have fought with skill and morale and effectiveness. Uh, and the uh, example they've set uh, provides, I think, uh, an example for Taiwan as well. So that when people say, well, will Taiwan fight for its independence? Or do they expect... <laughs> That's the right answer. <laughs> That's what China has to understand. That the people here believe in governing themselves and they're not going to give it up. And it's important that that's communicated to the United States. So that when commentators say the Taiwanese are, uh, uh, are using American support, uh, but they're really not prepared to defend themselves, that that's wrong. That that's wrong. And that if it came to military action, that Taiwan would fight. Showing that capability reduces the possibility of actual hostilities. 
by, by increasing uh, not just military capability, but the spirit that Taiwan believes in uh, its separateness uh, helps deter China from undertaking military action in the first place. That's why it's not provocative to build up uh, Taiwan's capabilities. Uh, as the saying goes, uh, strength is not provocative. Weakness is provocative. And that's what needs to be avoided in Taiwan. Uh, we, we know how important Taiwan is to the United States economically. It's the eighth largest trading partner of the United States, almost equal to the United Kingdom in terms of volume. We know about TSMC and computer chip manufacturing. There isn't any question of the importance of the relationship. But it's important that, uh, that in Taiwan, the uh, appreciation of explaining uh, to the U.S. and others, the determination and the willpower here uh, to, uh, to defend the, the freedom that, that you now have. Now, the, the question in the United States we face is, well, how, how exactly do we help Taiwan? And there are people who, uh, who wonder uh, whether the United States has, ha itself has the resolve and dependability to be a secure ally. Uh, there, there are reasons why people question this. I, I want to address this issue so that, uh, so that we can, I can, I think, resolve it or at least uh, show that we're aware that people are concerned about it. I know that uh, some of it comes from uh, Donald Trump uh, and what he said during his administration and the po prospect that he might come back, which I uh, hasten to assure you, I believe, is still small. But I've recounted in my book any number of times when Trump would hold up his Sharpie pen and he would point to the tip and say, see that? That's Taiwan. And then he'd point to the Resolute Desk in the Oval Office, which is a huge piece of furniture, and he'd say, that's China. And that's what, in his mind, made a difference. Uh, but Donald Trump was an aberration in American political life. And it's not going to be reflected when we get, I think, to the 2024 election. There are doubts about uh, uh, other Western countries. Uh, I'm sure Emmanuel Macron, the president of France, didn't win himself a lot of friends on this island when he went back to uh, France after visiting China and said that... Uh, uh, he wanted to have a global strategic partnership with China. That sounds a lot like an alliance. Uh, I'm sure you saw the, what the Chinese ambassador to France who uh, said about uh, uh, the lack of independence of the former republics of the Soviet Union. I don't know what it is in France, but maybe the ambassador and President Macron have, uh, have a relationship and exchanged these views before. Uh, I don't think that what Macron said really reflects where Europe is, I think. Uh, the, but but it, it shows the work that has to be done uh, uh, in order to maintain Taiwan's strength and diplomatic relations uh, around the world. We all talk about defense spending, for example. Uh, the United States spends about three and a quarter percent of its gross domestic product on defense. I have said, and others have said, we need to go back to the levels of Ronald Reagan's presidency, five to six percent, to face the threats we, fa we, we see around the world. Uh, NATO has a standard of two percent. Secretary General of NATO recently said it should go to three percent, which is, which is in the right direction, although not enough. The Prime Minister of Japan recently said he wanted to double def Japan's defense spending over the next five years to go from one to two percent of GDP, that's a step in the right direction. Taiwan spends about 2.4 percent of GDP on defense for this uh, current budget year. Uh, that's better than the NATO standard, so that's, uh, that's a plus. But if the U.S. is going to five or six percent, others have to come up too. That's a reality. Politicians don't like to talk about this. 
uh, no, no, of whatever party, but let's, let's look at the reality we're going to have to face. Um, you know, I would say when it comes to U.S. resolve and dependability, that we're, we are, of course, subject to democrat, democratic pressures, no better, no worse than any other country in that regard. But I'd also just leave you with uh, uh, words that Winston Churchill once said. He said, you can always count on the Americans to do the right thing, usually after they've tried everything else. <laughs> and there are times wh where we go through trying everything else, but just stay with us. We'll get to the right point in due course. Now, the, 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 the U.S. response to help Taiwan against the Chinese threat has to be fully global. And we have not yet reached the point, I think, where we're doing this. But we need to make up for lost time. Uh, and again, it's not just on political military issues. We have to uh, deal with Chinese economic misbehavior. But we also have to build up new structures of deterrence in advance of the Chinese threat becoming concrete. Because if we wait too long, it will be too late. So for example, economically, as I mentioned before, China has been stealing intellectual property from the United States and others for decades. Uh, we've done very little about it. But one thing that would get China's attention is if we said, no goods or services made in whole or in part from stolen intellectual property can be sold in the United States. That would wake them up because so much of their economy depends on stolen property. We could broaden that. We could have Japan and South Korea, Europe say the same thing. No Chinese goods based on anybody's stolen intellectual property could be sold in those markets. You know, when I've raised this proposal, some people say, but that's so harsh. That would have such a huge impact on trade. Well, yes, it would. That's the point. Because they've stolen so much, they, they, need, to be, they need to feel the pain. Um, you know, I think that um, we need to look at adjusting supply chains from China that affect national security. I'm not talking about a new industrial policy. I think most of it you can leave to the free market, as people realize we haven't reached the end of history, political risk still exists. Uh, but on things that involve key national security uh, supplies that come from China, I think we need a very careful assessment uh, of steps to take uh, to make sure that we don't find ourselves uh, reliant on China in time of crisis. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, that's something that Taiwan can be very helpful on. And I think this is another way to get conversations between uh, governments in Southeast Asia, in particular in Taiwan, whether or not there are full diplomatic relations, uh, to help talk about these economic issues. Now, on the politico-military side, I think there's a lot more bilaterally we need to do between the United States and Taiwan. I said in 2000, so 23 years ago, that the United States should extend full diplomatic relations to Taiwan. Uh, when, when Taiwan was expelled from the United Nations, uh, George H.W. Bush, who was then the U.S. ambassador, suggested as a compromise that uh, rather than oust Taiwan and seat the PRC, that we have what he called dual recognition, that Taiwan would keep its seat and that the PRC would take the permanent seat on the Security Council, but it would keep Taiwan in the UN and it would have allowed the US to extend recognition. That was rejected by both Taiwan and the PRC at the time. Uh, that's water over the dam, but it seems to me that dual recognition still makes sense from the U.S. perspective. This would be very displeasing to Beijing. 
But that, again, is part of the point, because it would show that the relationship between our two countries uh, is fixed and is not going to go away. There are a lot of things below the level of full diplomatic relations we can also do, and I hope will do uh, as time goes by. But beyond that, we need uh, a much deeper and richer strategic dialogue between officials of Taiwan, not just diplomats, but military officials, intelligence officials, everybody concerned with national security. The whole Taiwanese national security team needs deeper interaction with the U.S. national security team. It's not just a question of supplying this weapon system or that weapon system. We need coordination, uh, as we have with many other allies, uh, contingency planning, thinking through uh, what China might do and how we respond. If, if you have to think it through, once an attack has taken place, it's too late. And uh, it, it, uh, it really is something Taiwan should press for the more of this kind of discussion that we have to consider the complex range of scenarios that we might face, uh, the greater the prospect uh, of uh, successfully depending Taiwan, but even more important, the greater the prospect of deterring the Chinese aggression in the first place. I really think that um, if Xi Jinping did decide to make a move on Taiwan and failed, it would be regime threatening for him. And we need to do more to convince Xi Jinping that he can't prevail, because that ultimately is the way to success. Uh, we need uh, many more freedom of navigation exercises in the Taiwan Strait. We need to make it clear that these repeated Chinese efforts to surround Taiwan, to interfere in its airspace, to interfere in its operations in international waters. All of these things that China has been doing uh, are simply uh, not something that we can accept. You know, the, the uh, backlog in military sales to Taiwan is now estimated to be $19 billion. We need to clear that up. Part of that is uh, a U.S. problem. Our, Defense industrial base is not as strong as it used to be. Uh, we need to improve that for global reasons, but particularly for Taiwan. Uh, and we need to uh, see that other countries, like the European Union, uh, also do more to, uh, to, to stand up to these Chinese threats. The head of the European Union foreign policy, Josep Borrell of Spain, uh, called on European navies also to conduct freedom of navigation operations uh, in the Taiwan Strait. And that's a, that's a real plus. And we have to tell uh, China and Russia what the consequences are if they take action against Taiwan, not just in the immediate response, but over the longer term, to uh, basically uh, excommunicate China from the international economic system if it did take military action against Taiwan or attempt uh, to uh, throw a blockade around it. Uh, there's much more that needs to be done, not just in the military space, not just making Taiwan a porcupine, but getting more cooperation from other countries in the region uh, and around the world. Because as I said earlier, the more Taiwan is embedded with other countries in collective security, collective defense efforts, the lower the likelihood that China will take military action.